welcome my dear friends to a series of talks on contemplative lifestyle. I am Father John Francis Iqvera, a Carmelite priest belonging to Karnataka, Goa province in India. The theme of our reflection today is contemplative lifestyle as a celebration of thirst. First and foremost, I strongly believe that for a Christian, contemplation or living a life of intimacy with God is not an option, but a way of life. It is not a part-time activity like spending an hour in the morning or in the evening with God or before the Blessed Sacrament as contemplation. Rather, it is a life spent in the intimacy with God, in the person of Jesus Christ, with the gift of the Holy Spirit, 24 hours 7, all the time, every breath of it. Hence, contemplation is a lifestyle. Second, I also strongly believe that it is not true to say that only a few are specifically chosen for this sublime way of life. Rather, every baptized Christian has been invited by God to participate intimately in his divine life in love. If so, it is your turn and my turn to come to the conviction of this great truth and appropriate this great gift of God to us mortals, transforming each one of us in the true likeness of God, thereby learning to live as the children of God. This whole process of achieving this goal of human life that is, to live in the likeness of God through divine intimacy is what I would call a celebration of thirst. Why would I call it a celebration of thirst? Let me explain. It is the American poet Emily Dixon who said, Water is taught by thirst. It is when you are thirsty you understand the meaning and the need of water more than any other time. Similarly, when you are thirsty for God, you understand the existence and the need of Him in your life more than any other time. What is the origin of this thirst? Where is this thirst coming from? To put it in a simple way, the origin of this thirst is primarily innate. That is, within ourselves, within our very nature. It is more appropriate to say that it is created by God who lives within us in the innermost being of our soul. That is why Karl Rahner the great German theologian of our times would call this thirst as the transcendental existential. Raymond Panikkar called it the archetype of the monk. Wine Dyer as the power of intentionality. St. Augustine rightly said the same thing when he prayed, Our hearts are created for thee, o Lord. They are restless until they rest in thee. We who are created in the image and likeness of God, who are breathed into our nostrils the breath of his very life, are naturally called upon to live unto that finality. Hence, the transcendence or the thirst for God is not something artificial that we create within ourselves as a pastime luxury, rather it is the very essence of being who we are. 
the word of God gives ample examples for the justification of this truth. For example, the Gospel of John takes us into the very heart of this thirst when he talks about the call of the first disciples in the chapter 1 verse 35. One evening, John the Baptist was standing there on the road with two of his disciples. Seeing Jesus passing by, John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Hearing this, the two disciples leave John and run behind Jesus. Jesus turns around and asks them, What are you searching for? What are your hearts thirsty about? And they answer, Master, where are you staying? Meaning, Master, what does it mean to be with you and to live like you? Jesus says, come and see, meaning, experience it for yourself by being with me. The scripture concludes, they went, they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him, never to return back for the rest of their lives. Once you experience him, the thirst of our heart is quenched. And we stay forever at the fountain of living water. Living by that fountain of living water forever, being quenched by the divine springs, is partly a celebration of thirst for the soul. The soul experiences within itself this terrific sense of joy as a result of being quenched by God. However, we should not forget that God is the primary source of this thirst in the human heart. God is thirsty for your love and my love. In other words, God longs like a loving father that we, his children, live in the fullness of life, ever being satisfied by the experience of his love living according to the nature in which we are created. Again, the word of God gives us ample example of this truth. Let us just take one passage. Passage from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Let me read it for you. Let me sing for my beloved my long song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, in evidence of Jerusalem and the people of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? God expresses the sadness and sorrow through Isaiah when his dreams for his people is not fulfilled. He had made a covenant with Israel and the law of the covenant was very clear. I am your God and you are my people. Now this covenant was broken by the people by running behind other gods, thereby resulting in producing wild grapes. However, the most illustrious word of God which is at the very foundation of our reflection today is the very pronunciation of the word I thirst coming from the mouth of the person of Jesus as it is given to us in the Gospel of John chapter 19 verse 28. It was true that Jesus was physically thirsty given the hardships and the passion he endured. But his thirst was much deeper to it than 
all are just see that everyone is liberated from this enslavement of sin and the world and come back to him and once again begin to live at the fountain of life as God's beloved children. Luke chapter 22 verse 15 so beautifully puts the desire of Jesus when it expresses I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This shows the urgency and the intensity of his desire to liberate us. He was thirsty to quench our thirst and continue to live at the fountain of life. It is to this end the Lord Jesus invites each one of us when he cries out aloud standing at one of the water tanks at the festival of booths. If anyone is thirsty let him come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said out of the believer's heart shall flow springs of living water. John chapter 7 verse 37. The invitation is not just to drink and quench one thirst, but to see that our lives be the fountains of living water. The book of Revelation reiterates this invitation as it is given to us in the chapter 22 verse 17. And let everyone who is thirsty come let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift take. When the thirst of God for bringing humanity back unto himself on one hand and the thirst for the human heart to be quenched by the divine love meet each other, the celebration of thirst takes its fullest meaning. Now, there comes the biggest paradox of our lives. If our hearts are created for God and they are thirsty for God on one hand and God himself runs behind us as a mad lover to bring us back unto himself, why is that? The people are failing to respond to this divine invitation and celebrate this greatest bliss of their life all along their lives? The answer would be it is because of the shift of focus. Instead of focusing on the lasting goals of our lives, we humans are more worried about what is immediately in store for us. What can satisfy us momentarily? Therefore, what is required from us is to reshift our focus from what we call worldliness and come back to begin to live at the source of this celebration, God himself, the fountain of life. Book of Exodus, specifically Exodus chapter 17 verse 3 and the following, speak about this ideology so well. Moses was called by God to liberate the people from the clutches of the Egyptians and bring them to the promised land. They have crossed the red tree and they are on their way into the desert. And they come at a moment called, a place called Rephabim. And Moses, obeying the word of God, pitches the tent there in the desert. There was no water and they thirsted for water. However, if you look into the text more deeply, the word esima is in the imperfect form, often rendered as future tense, meaning they were not tormented by thirst at that moment. There was enough water. But they are frightened that they may not 
get water in the future. And as a result, going to be thirsty. Not today, not at this present, but tomorrow. This passage gives us the clue why we fail to celebrate this divine grace. We run behind the immediate realities that satisfy our immediate worldly thirst because we are impatient, we are frightened of the future. And thereby, our thirst for eternal water, God Himself, is quietly forgotten. However, the person of Moses gives us the authentic response to this thirst that is to obey the word of God. God had told him that he requires to camp at Rephidim, whether there was water or there was no water. Because God will provide. I obey. And finally, we know God provides. Spiritual life, my dear friends, begins when we come to realize that we require to be thirsty for this water. We want to obey God by understanding His will in our life, by knowing how to live as a child. The episode of the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, as it is given to us by John chapter 4 verses 13 to 15, is an example par excellence. It was the noontime and the Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Jesus being thirsty comes there and asks for an water. And the whole dialogue that takes place between Jesus and this woman is very interesting. And finally Jesus reveals to her who he really was. If at all you knew the gift of God and who is asking you for water, you would have asked him water instead and he would have given you life-giving water. And when this Samaritan woman came to realize who Jesus was, she asked him to give her that living water. I think what is most important in our spiritual quest is this prayer, Lord, give me that water so that I may not be thirsty. I think that exactly was the life of the mystics. The saints, St. Teresa in her book of life, chapter 30, verse 19, repeats the same prayer, Da Miki Aqua, Lord, give me that water. St. John of the Cross, in his book, Dark Knight, poem 1, so beautifully explains it as one dark night, fired with long, love's urgent longing. O oh, sheer grace, I went out unseen, my house being now all still. Celebration of thirst is this constant dialogue, constant process of thirst for him and being drunk of him. It is a process, not a moment. There is never a moment in the life of a person, a believer, where I can say, I have stopped thirsting for him. Because the desire to experience God is eternal. Because no one can be satisfied him completely in his life, given our limitations, given our finality. At the same time, God never stops coming behind us pulling us unto himself and thereby constantly quenching our thirst. It is in this desire for God and God quenching our thirst, the entire celebration moves on and on and on. 
Shall we therefore go to this fountain of living water and begin to drink of this water whereby we can begin to participate in this celebration? Celebrate the thirst for God. Celebrate the thirst of your soul. God bless you.